Uh, thank you. It's uh, an amazing crowd and amazing things I've seen. I'm, I'm really glad I'm here and um, looking forward to learning more. So uh, I'm Ken. I'm from uh, University of Utah, where I uh, am associate CMIO, overseeing uh, operational clinical distance sport activities and our uh, interoperability activities, one of which I'll uh, discuss today. And uh, I'm also co-chair at the HL7 Clinical Distance Sport Work Group. And I did all my training here, so I'm actually still an adjunct uh, assistant professor here. And I think I finished my master's project last year, which I presented to Amy and just closed out the IRB. So I'm um, really glad to be back here. And it's amazing how much this place has grown and buildings have come up. It's, 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 it's really amazing. Let's see, uh, before I begin, just some disclosures. Uh, I have been a consultant or sponsored researcher on clinical distance support in the past year for ONC through some contractors. Uh, McKesson, Intercol, and Hitachi. So just as some context, what I'll be discussing today in terms of the bilirubin app we've uh, developed and deployed in our EPIC system uh, is part of uh, what we call our IAPS initiative at the University of Utah, or Interoperable Apps and Services Initiative. So this is uh, something that's uh, co-chaired by our CIO and CMIO, and it's really about how can we uh, extend our native uh, EHR functionality, which in our case is uh, EPIC, uh, through interoperable extensions. So work with the operational things. And, you know, I've taken a ton of training. I think I was at Epic uh, headquarters for like five weeks of training. So we know every a lot of what you can do with Epic, but there are some places where you want to um, extend the EHR. So our goal is to, uh, to take these um, uh, capabilities and uh, for sure improve patient care, but also really importantly, improve the provider experience. So I th there's been a lot coming out recently, which uh, if you're a provider, you know that, you know, you just have a lot on your plate. I think there was a JAMA editorial noting that uh, providers now spend about two hours on clerical and EHR work for every hour they spend um, uh, doing direct patient care. And our providers let us know that very, very directly. So they're extremely happy when we can tell them we can make your life easier with these kind of things. You know, it's just amazing when you're in meetings with folks and, you know, and then the physicians actually give, give you an applause during a, you know, just like a meeting because they're like, they're so happy that you can uh, meet their need through some of these extensions. And looking at the kind of things people are developing, I'm really excited in my operational role that I'll be able to choose from a lot of these um, great things and propose uh, adding them into our, our mix. So in our efforts, um, uh, our scope includes both uh, smart on fire applications, like what I'll uh, des uh, describe today that we've done and uh, CDS, or distance support web services, uh, using uh, what's known as the HL7 Fire Clinical Reasoning Module, which has now been uh, in the process of being unified with an effort known as CDS SOOCs, which Josh Mendel, I think, uh, was out here um, uh, really uh, spearheaded and led, now led by Kevin Shackleton at, uh, at, uh, at Cerner. And uh, uh, recently, this unification work has uh, really taken on, uh, thanks to uh, Kevin and Isaac Better from Epic and others. So this particular project was a multi-institutional collaboration. Uh, uh, from the University of Utah, I've um, uh, focused on uh, leading up the technical side. Um, Carol Steipelman, who's our medical director of our pediatrics clinic, is the main physician champion. Uh, at Intermountain Healthcare, uh, Scott Neris, who's the chief clinical system architect, has been the champion. At Duke, it was uh, uh, Ricky Bloomfield and Robert Lampesti. Uh, Ricky is here. He's now with Apple. Uh, and I believe uh, Robert has also left, but I was just meeting with uh, David Tanaka, a neonatologist here uh, this morning, and he was very excited to uh, uh, continue moving forward with our collaboration. So uh, we're working on this uh, project on multiple EHR platforms. Uh, on the EPIC platform, uh, the current members uh, include University of Town Duke. On the Cerner platform, uh, Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, we also use CareWeb, which is the open source uh, uh, EHR integration framework from the Healthcare Services Platform Consortium. And everything we're, uh, we've done is free, open source, uh, no strings attached kind of stuff. So if anybody's interested, we'd be happy to share this. Um, uh, we're, we're really doing this just because we want to improve our patient's care. So uh, what we started with was a baseline bilirubin app, which was developed uh, by Intermountain for their Cerner platform. And this just shows how this looks uh, integrated into our Epic platform. You can see on the left-hand side, there's a tab for the bilirubin app. And what we started with was uh, uh, what Intermountain had, which was uh, visualization of the bilirubin levels over time um, and just uh, uh, overlay of uh, risk zones uh, based on population data. 
So when we approached our physicians at uh, the University of Utah saying, hey, you know, this is a cool thing Intermountain's developed, uh, do you want to use it here? What they basically said was, well, that's great. Um, uh, for us to really want to use it, we want the American Academy of Pediatrics or AAP guidelines on how to do uh, patient-specific uh, management of hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, and for those who aren't clinical, if you have high bilirubin levels after birth, you can get brain damage, which is obviously not a good thing to have. Um, so uh, the AP has guidelines for when you initiate phototherapy, uh, depending on uh, different uh, uh, patient risk thresholds. And they also have uh, uh, guidelines on when to do uh, exchange transfusion. And what uh, currently typically happens is people use uh, online tools that either have some EHR integration or require manual integration, where you know you have uh, people writing down the bilirubin lab levels and like entering into the system, uh, usually just the last one to do a point estimate and saying, okay, what do we need to do? So. Uh, this is already happening, except it's a manual process, and um, there's nothing that infuriates physicians, like things that they have to write down on a piece of paper uh, and then uh, do when they, they think, oh my goodness, uh, can't you do this for us, IT? And then, um, um, and then we uh, at now can really say, yeah, we'd be happy to do it for you. So this is a, a screenshot from our current Brilubin application. This is in production use with an Epic. Um, so uh, what you see here, um, uh, again, it's, it's, it's the bilirubin app uh, tab that you can uh, access if you're a pediatrician in our system. Uh, you can see, um, yeah, so on here it's uh, uh, y-axis is the bilirubin levels over time, x-axis as hours since birth. Uh, the blue line shows the uh, bilirubin levels, and uh, for bilirubins, you can both use a transcutaneous uh, measurement, and you can do a, a, a serum or a, a blood measurement. And uh, we integrate both, but because transcutaneous uh, labs have a little bit of um, uh, different performance characteristics, we uh, visually label that with the T, which you can see also over here also labeled transcutaneous. We do things like sometimes manually enter data, doesn't have appropriate units or isn't a number, et cetera. So we, uh, if those things happen, we highlight those kind of things as well. Uh, the three lines you see in green are the AAP guidelines for uh, thresholds for phototherapy. And the bold-based one is the one that we've auto-selected based on the patient risk factors. Uh, the red one is for exchange transfusion thresholds. Um, uh, again, uh, auto-selected. Yellow uh, indicates the phototherapy that's been documented in the chart uh, by, the, um, by the nursing staff. Uh, you can see here we have the uh, risk factors that are used in order to determine uh, what's the right threshold. Uh, this is auto-pulled in from uh, the record, it includes things like gestational age, here you can see this patient was uh, positive for a direct Coombs uh, test. Uh, tells you it was from September 28th in the record. Um, uh, and then uh, we have albumin levels. Uh, something cool here, uh, our physician said, you know what, uh, beyond those specific risk factors, we have some other data points that we usually hunt and pet for. And they've given us interesting sort of click studies of what they currently do. And uh, usually, initial reports uh, indicate they save a few minutes uh, each time they do this. Um, so this, for example, pulls in the baby's blood type and indirect whom's really cool here. Uh, we can identify the link in the uh, medical record for who the mother is. And so we can go into the mother's record and pull uh, her data in too so that the you know, physician doesn't have to say, okay, who's the mother? I'm gonna go into her chart. I'm gonna go into her chart review, look for this info. Uh, so our physicians seem to really like this. Um, they're quite happy with it. Um, I guess the only downside is they keep having more ideas. So I'm meeting with them again in a few weeks where they're gonna tell me all the great ideas they have for making this better. Uh, we do encapsulate all the uh, underlying logic. Uh, there's quite a lot in there in terms of what lines to draw, what the recommendations are. We put it within an open source uh, distance support platform uh, known as OpenCDS. Um, and this allows use of things like uh, flow diagramming, BPMN uh, for logic execution. This is all free open source uh, Apache 2 license. And we support a number of HL7 distance support standards. So, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the things we've learned, I think most folks who've uh, implemented these things have learned, is the current fire resources in the DAF, US Core, Argonaut profiles are pretty loose, which means when you're actually implementing these, you, you have a lot of times when you're saying, hmm, I could implement it as A, or I could implement it as B, I'm going to implement it as B, and here's some documentation I'm going to say of like in using this app, this is how you need to implement this. And um, it certainly works, but I think it's uh, important to have profiling. So we're using uh, something called the QI Core Fire Profiles, where uh, Claude Nanjo from Cognitive Medical Systems has created a free um, uh, API on top of Happy Fire uh, to support these profiles. 
Uh, we also support the HL7 Distance Support Service for interacting with OpenCDS, and um, uh, we have been supporting the Fire Clinical Reasoning Module. As I noted, this is being unified with the CDS Hook specification. So we're going all in to support CDS hooks, and uh, we'll be uh, uh, migrating this to CDS hooks as well. So status, uh, 1.0 release is complete. It's uh, fully integrated with Epic and uh, CareWeb EHRs. It's in production clinical use. Providers love it. Um, uh, when I get occasion, I got one email from uh, one of the providers saying, hey, you know, this was wrong. Like, this is what it says in the chart. And then I looked, and it was, she had pulled it for the mother's info rather than the baby's. And I emailed back, she said, oh, you're right. The app was correct. So it's great when you get uh, bug, bug reports, and it ends up the app was actually right. Um, so we're enhancing this, aiming for wide dissemination of the 2.0 release. Um, again, it's free. Anybody who's uh, interested in potentially using it, their healthcare system, um, uh, we'd be happy to share um, uh, no strings attached. Uh, and then we were awarded uh, some uh, awards from the Provider User Experience App Challenge Awards. So I was going to do a demo, but um, uh, I'm going to just skip it so I can spend a little bit more time on uh, some uh, thoughts that we've learned. So some lessons we've learned. Um, uh, one is that the initial learning curve is fairly high. Uh, that's what we learned uh, doing this. There's a lot of little things that we learned that um, things like, oh, you know, once, once you get into from the test to the production environment, now you need to use the Care Everywhere ID instead of this ID, you know, things like that. Um, and our hope is that this will become easier so in, as interoperable apps and services become more mainstream. And it's certainly our commitment that we would never want to compete with others on the middleware layer or you know, how to do this kind of thing layer. I think that's, that's just not the right thing, for, at least for our healthcare system to do. And um, uh, so we're committed to making everything we do on the layer of uh, middleware, um, you know, how to kind of things open. Uh, I, I think it's, it, the situation we want to be in is where we're really working on developing functionality and not competing on you know, how do you actually like, make the widgets work together. Uh, security is a critical consideration. Um, I think it's enough said, but um, uh, it's my viewpoint that once there's, if there's one major uh, breach on this, this kind of thing will die. Um, so we are very cognizant of it and uh, very aware of it, um, I, as I think, uh, as I know all of us are. Um, as I noted, standards such as Fire are still evolving and require greater specificity, specificity for true plug and play interoperability. So I think. This is probably the next phase as we all work on these things. And I think all of us who've implemented this realize, like, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot more that needs to be specified. And I think we all should work together rather than uh, doing that on our own uh, through places like HL7. And another thing we learned is that cross-institutional and cross-platform collaboration can significantly accelerate development. So we specifically started with something Intermountain had developed on their Cerner platform and went from there. We're doing similar things with like the growth chart application that um, uh, was developed at Boston Children's that, uh, and then uh, uh, Intermountain uh, productionized it onto their Cerner platform. And then we're bringing into our Epic platform where our providers had uh, more enhancements, but we're not having to redo everything. We're just uh, able to enhance. And uh, again, with that one, we're uh, going to release everything back to the community because um, uh, we'd like to do that. So some future directions, we're working to scale up the initiative evaluate impact, influence underlying technical standards. And I think important is prioritizing projects with the greatest impact potential. Um, I think as a technology geek, like, you know, we, we get really excited about, oh, we were able to do a fire write operation, or we were able to pull the mother's, you know, info. But really, that stuff doesn't matter, right? It, what matters is what kind of impact we can have. So uh, I think working on the right projects is critical. And we're working on things like data-driven opportunity identification, and I have some uh, uh, references for things we've done at the University of Utah, including a recent um, uh, publication in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And of course, we'd like to explore potential for expanded collaborations. And if anybody's interested in collaborating with us, um, uh, I'm here at the whole meeting. I'd love to talk with you. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much.